I learned a big lesson from my grandmother, right? You know, she finally started doing the things that she loved to do at 65 years old. Um, and unfortunately, she ended up having cancer and she so badly did not want to die. And her last words to me, and I knew I'd never see her again. I remember I was on release from the military. And she said to me, like I said, you never want to be sitting on your deathbed saying the words I wish or what if, right? You know, and I think it's a one time deal. And we have to remember that, you know, you can't stop living when you're still alive. And I don't care if you're 20, I don't care if you're 90. You have to do the things that you love because your biggest regret will be the things that you haven't done, not the things that you have done, right? And do as much as you can and cherish it and don't be afraid of it because this is it. This is what we've got. This is a one-time deal, man. We don't get second chances. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have the powerful Leah Goldstein. Leah was a world champion kickboxer at the age of 17 and in her early 20s became both a special forces officer and undercover police officer, always being at the top of her game in whatever she immersed herself into. At the age of 30, Leah moved into the area of professional cycling, and at the age of 52, this year, Leah became the first woman ever to win the solo division of the 3,000-mile race across America, beating everyone, including men. She's a sought after speaker and author of the book, No Limits. What I personally love about this conversation is Leah's absolute concrete approach to life. She has this strong mindset of never quitting, never negotiating with yourself, this whatever you choose to do, you finish it approach. She's hardcore, I'll give her that. As someone myself who is passionate about endurance and the mindset behind it, this is one influential woman who has truly expanded my awareness of what is really possible, if you want it. She's had two serious cycling accidents, one at 80 kilometers an hour, breaking almost all of her bones. Professionals telling her she'll never compete again. The lesson here being, don't listen to people who tell you your potential limitations, even if they are experts. Focus on what you want, back your self-belief, And this is what Leah did. She won the hardest race in the world, race across America at the age of 52. And this is another angle, age. Don't use it as an excuse. There is inevitably so many layers to Leah, and I think I will best do this conversation justice if I just let you listen to it, to take all the powerful, powerful lessons from her life, her achievements, and from her awe-inspiring character. Enjoy this conversation with the phenomenal Leah Goldstein. Welcome to the podcast, Leah. Thank you for having me. (laughs) You're very welcome. I'm excited for this one, Leah. So I wanted to start with a quote from your book, No Limits. And you shared in the book, you said, but the reason isn't that simple. While most people would be afraid to take on a race like this, I was scared not to, scared of the ordinary, of being normal, disappearing. My entire life, I've been the girl who everyone watches to see what crazy thing will happen next. I feared that if I stopped racing, I would lose part of myself. That thing that pumps me full of adrenaline and makes me feel alive would be lost and I'd never be the same. Competition was like my best friend and I wasn't ready to lose it. So Leah, I would love to start with you sharing a little bit more about your competitive side, uh, your best friend, and how that was developed in your earlier years. Um, I think I always liked the challenge, right? Because I had a lot of Mm. personal challenges. Like, you know, when I was a child, I mean, I had a a learning disability. Um, I was put in a special class. Uh, I spoke with a lisp. And on the physical side, you know, I had issues with my left leg. It was uh, growing at a faster rate. It was longer couldn't quite bend my foot. So doctors told my parents that I'd never excel in in sports and anything with athleticism, right? So you kind of have a double whammy there, right? (laughs) So I knew I'd have challenges, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't let it deter me or stop me from the dreams or the things that I wanted to do. But I think that kind of, it stemmed from that, knowing that anything that I'd want to do, that I'd have to probably work twice as hard to achieve it, right? But I was ready for it because it's not that I was fearless, but I didn't let fear dictate my path. Yeah, it's so incredibly beautiful. And, you know, what was so amazing about your story, because as you're aware, you know, I read your book, No Limits, very recently, is just 
how from such a young age you have such drive and determination like true determination that like I really see I really feel is quite rare in someone so young that you know doesn't have as much life experience that generally comes with sort of that mental fortitude can you share a little bit more about you know your teenage years and sort of how that accelerated your achievement I mean, I mean, competitiveness started for me at a very young age, and it's because of bullying, right? I was picked on, right. you know, when I was a little girl, you know, and, uh, you know, seeing Bruce Lee on TV was kind of my salvation. Now I got to <laughs> learn whatever that, you know, that guy is doing. And so it kind of stemmed from that because I excelled in Taekwondo. That was my first sport. Um, and the reason why is because my father was a national champion in the sport of boxing. So he okay. taught me how to box at a very young age. Like I didn't watch soccer or football or hockey, what most Canadians or North Americans watch. We watched boxing and my father's <laughs> very animated. So you kind of mix Taekwondo and boxing, you know, and you get more of a kickboxer. So, and because I excelled so much and I became a black belt, you know, by 12 years old, um, junior national champion, that's how I transitioned into kickboxing. But going mm -hmm. into the sport, you know, kind of with a big head and getting a little bit knocked up in the, in the ring <laughs> and then Kind of going from there is, you know, I think what drives me is when people say that I can't do something, mm -hmm. I like to prove them wrong. And I think that's what the, the adrenaline inside is like, you know, is proving what I can't do. Because I knew, like I said, I knew that I had challenges, right? But in that particular sport, I mean, it just came natural to me. And that's why, you know, I excelled so fast. And I, you know, at 17 years old, I was the world, you know, undefeated champion of the world. Yeah, talk to me more about that because, you know, being 17 years old and being like, a world champion kickboxing like that required a lot of self-discipline that wasn't just sort of something that you woke up and you were talented at like the amount of commitment that that took for you to get there over the few years that you sort of worked towards that was pretty intensive in terms of like diet and training and everything that you committed to it could you kind of elaborate on what it sort of took in your day-to-day -to, -day to be sort of the best in the world at such a young age well, let's back up a little bit. Like when I walked into that kickboxing studio, like, you know, I was a second degree black belt. I kind of had a big head because I knew I was good. <laughs> and so the coach there, he kind of wanted to teach me a lesson. So this is what I was saying about getting beat up. He puts me in a boxing ring and he, and he brings in this kid half my size. And I think, damn, I'm going to kill him. You know, second degree <laughs> black belt. And he was, he was, but he was his most skilled fighter. So he throws a punch. It, it hits me in the face and I get really mad. And I start throwing my best moves and nothing's making contact and I'm getting really frustrated. And then the coach comes in, you know, he stops me, he goes, go home and think about it. And I was totally deflated at that point because, you know, because for me being able to defend myself also stopped all the bullying at school, you know. And then I remember coming home. I didn't want my mom to see me because I knew I was kind of, you know, a little bit of a bloody nose. And as soon as I open the door, my mom's standing there. And the first thing she says or first thing I say is, mom, I'm going to be a kickboxer. Right. <laughs> So I went to the studio the next day and Alan Chang, my coach, you know, he basically said to me, you know, you want to do this sport. His English wasn't very good. He goes, no smoking, no drinking, no drugs, no friends, no swear, no phone, train seven days a week, train twice a day. Then he goes, you do that 17, you world champion. Mm -hmm. And so I learned Phenomenal. at that age, what does it take to be the best at anything you choose to do? That's 110%. You know, and I didn't train seven days a week, twice a day. I trained seven days a week, three times a day. And I did give up all the friends and partying and all the teenage stuff. Because for me, you know, when you hear you can be a world champion at 17, that's what was my goal. And I was determined and, and it just lasered in. And that's what I, that's what was going to, I was going to make that happen. And something that was so distinctive about that time in your life that you refer to in your book is like, you really enjoyed that. Like that wasn't something that was like you, you know, later in your life, you sort of, get into these feats that are more like work, I guess, quote unquote, but it felt like sort of in your early years and those like early experiences, like you really loved what you were doing. I loved what I was doing because it's the one thing that just came natural to me. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It was such an, like the is a good point that you said is this, that was the one sport, like it was cycling. It took me a little while, ultra, ultra endurance. It took me a while, you know, to, to progress and to, to kind of to reach the levels that I wanted to reach at. But with Taekwondo and kickboxing, it was easy for me. Not that I didn't work hard, but I progressed really fast. And it just felt like second nature to me. And that's why I excelled. And I think too, just struggling as a young child with everything else and being so good at, at that particular sport is what drew me to it. Because it also, it, it gave me a lot of attention to people noticed it and go, damn, she's good at it. Finally, I was finally good at something, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was really humorous that, you know, Alan was kind of like, 
during this time sort of like trying to think about your future and he had you kind of like training with like nunchucks and things like this sort of thinking that you may potentially sort of get into movies sort of down Correct. the road which was really fascinating but you know you obviously had other plans other plans from such a young age can you sort of talk about that transition into what you did after that for sure i mean alan chang his his idea was you know he wanted to fight for me to fight very little because, you know, you can get banged up and it's not good to get hit in the head, right? So he wanted me to, you know, win like a world championship so I have a title and then try and make it into the movies. Like be the female, you know, Bruce Lee, right? <laughs> that was his goal. But that wasn't my goal. Because, I mean, I, my big dream from as young as I could remember was ever to be, you know, Bruce Lee or, you know, this world kickboxing champion. I wanted to be James Bond. And I knew when I graduated from high school, right, that I would go back to Israel, that's where we're from, and I would go into the military, join the IDF, and then from there, hoping that I'd, you know, work with some form of, well, one of the branches of intelligence. So that was kind of my goal that I never told anybody, you know, it was just something that I knew I was going to do from a very young age. And I just love this transition because it just, again, it just shows, I feel like you're so clear on your goals from the get-go when you do things. And even going into the IDF, it was just like you wanted to be the best. And, and you know, it, it kind of manifested even in your training and everything that you did in the lead up. It was like, I think initially you even like set a, a record for like the training things that you needed to do, like anything that you touched, you seemed to just do phenomenally in. Can you sort of talk about those earlier days of sort of moving into this space that, you know, from such a young age, from being a younger girl that you've like sort of been dreaming for years of? Well, I mean, I worked incredibly hard as a, as a martial arts, as a kickboxer, and I wanted to bring that over, that worth ethic, you know what I mean, and that mm -hmm. mindset with everything else that I wanted to do. And especially going into the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, I had to be exceptional for what I wanted to do. I couldn't be an average soldier. I had to be above and beyond. And I trained actually in Canada for the things that I knew would happen in the Middle East, right? And it was more the mental stuff because they try to, you know, break you mentally more than anything else. Physically, I already had it, right? And I think they were kind of questionable. I mean, even when I went into um, the military, if a Canadian girl living in this country where I am can handle that kind of stress, right? You know, um, because it's a different mentality. But I was prepared for it, right? I mean, mind you, my coach... As I said, you know, in, in many interviews, he never complimented me. I never got a, hey, good job. I always said, you could always do better, always do better. I mean, he didn't need to blow up my head with the things that I were good at. I knew what I was good at that. You know, we don't have to. We always focus on making me even better and better because there's always one step up. Right. And that was kind of my mindset. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it's good to have confidence. But when that confidence turns to cockiness, that's when you get hit the hardest. Right. So with that mindset and also being humble because you don't want to talk too much. Right. You know, right. Um, I, I, I follow that principle and I still do to this day. Right. You know what I mean? It's more. A lot of people make noise from the mouth, but it doesn't mean anything. Rather, I, I am more of an action person than a verbal person. So in the IDF, like, so what sort of happens from here? Because, like, to my understanding, you're kind of wanting to move into, like, uh, a more secretive space. Yeah. Sort of how did that sort of, like, what was the journey in between sort of volunteering the IDF and then sort of wanting to move on to, you know, quote, unquote, bigger and better things? Right. I mean, it's not your decision for one, right? Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, I want to work for like, you know, an intelligence branch like the Shabak or the Mossad or whatever. They seek you. You don't seek them, right? So I had to be noticeable with, with the things that I could do. And I was right from the get-go. I was put into a selection base, right? So what that is, is basically 300 or 400 soldiers that, uh, you know, different branches of intelligence or whatever, different organizations see in that individual, they put you through a training process. And within that 300, we get cut to 150, to 50, to 25, to 10, and then to five. So I was part of that um, process. And I ended up to be one of the five. And from there, I ended up in a military intelligence space called Base 8. And talk to me about that experience. Like what did your day to day sort of look like, you know, being a part of that now? Well, the early, it was tough. The early stuff, share. like I said, the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was more in the beginning, it was more the physical part of like, you know, we would do, we would train all day, right? You know, not, right. not just uh, the physical, but mentally too, right? And then, you know, for example, they'd wake us up at three o'clock in the morning, we'd do a 50 kilometer trek with our gear, with our, you know, N16s, or whatever. And then we'd be finished. They'd we'd say, okay, you have three hours to rest. 
the uh, commander would go out, walk out. Two minutes later, another, another commander would walk in and go, we're going out again, right? So it's stuff like that or promising, you know, after two weeks of hell, oh, you guys get 24 hours release to go home, right? And everyone's so excited mm-hmm. and everything. <laughs> and I go, you know what? If it sounds too good to be true, it's not going to happen, right? So I knew these little tricks and I was prepared for it, right? You know, so they they watch you. They see how you interact, how you handle everything, what kind of stress you are you're going through, right? They know everything about about you. I mean, even before I went in to to um, to the IDF, I was interviewed many times and they would ask me questions. And if I fumbled, they would correct it for me. That's how much they knew about me. Right. So, you know, wow. you, you have to be deadly honest with them. Right. You know, and I wasn't always and they caught me. So I started to pick it up. Go, OK. You know, they know me a lot better than I know me. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It sounds so intensive. And so I guess like you know, obviously as much as you can share, like how do you, what happens here? Because to my understanding, you sort of want to go deeper into this space, but your life kind of takes a turn and you end up sort of in the undercover police unit instead. Well, I mean, it started with the military, right? I started, um, I was picked up by uh, a unit called Krav Maga. And so I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard of that term. Krav Maga is a, mm-hmm. Krav, Krav Maga is a Hebrew word. It means um, lethal hand combat that every soldier must must learn. So I was the first female instructor actually to go into this department and also the first female instructor to train the commando, right? So that all already gave attention because, you know, not that I was, I mean, for any woman or man to even be able to train how those, you know, soldiers train is already kind of out of the norm. And I was able easily to, to train with them, you know. Um, so from there, I was uh, taken on different operations inside the military, which was unexpected. They would basically put me on a bus. I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing until I got to the location. I wouldn't, didn't know where I was. And you're basically given your assignment like, you know, three minutes before you're heading out. And you don't know who you're with, who you're meeting or whatnot. So it was kind of those kind of operations. And then from there, um, that's when I transitioned more into, into the police force from the military. Yeah. And how, how different was that experience? Like, was it, was it something that you were excited for in that transition or was it sort of something that you just felt like that kind of just ended up being the trajectory in the way that oh, you were Oh, no, moving? the police, when I, no, <laughs> they put me through the ringer in the police force. Yeah. It was not, <laughs> it was not what I expected, right? Mm. You know, I mean, I mean, I worked with a very elite unit in the military and then mm-hmm. when I transitioned into the police force, I felt like I was like in the bottom of the barrel, like just right. the pit. They put me into this police department that, you know, I mean, there was a program in the one, my first police department that I worked at, there was a program there that rehabilitated criminals to become police officers. And it was the worst station you could end up in. And I was so <laughs> confused. I go, what the heck am I doing here after what I've done in the past? Right. Mm-hmm. But again, it's, it's all a test, right? I, I, I believe it is, you know, um, and then I started to realize, too, um, of the corruption and stuff, which which was um, affecting me, too, like personally. Right. You know that it was not something that I wanted to be part of. But I actually, you know, you kind of get sucked into it. And, and and eventually, you know, instead of solving problems, you almost become a problem. Right. So right. that transition happened a little bit later. But I did actually end up working um, uniform only for three months. And after three months, I was picked up by um, a spying unit called the Belouche. And in order to get into the Belouche, you need three to four years of police experience to even be considered. I was three months in uniform, and that's in the first woman to be considered. I mean, I was under wow. probation, and they put me through the testing, but that's kind of how it started, you know? So, I mean, like, I just thought, well, what the heck? Like, it just, it, that was a tough time. Because, I mean, it's like going, you know, from Beverly Hills to Harlem or whatever, right? <laughs> right. Okay. And then, you, yeah. and, you know, you have no, your, your hands are kind of tied because don't forget when you work for the government, you know, you're basically stuck there till you're 45 years old. And I was like barely 20. Right. You know, so, you know, right. that's so a lifetime, you know, exactly. And I didn't have that power to say, well, I can't, I don't want to work here. You work where they put you. Right. But, you know, I mean, I do follow one principle that I don't care what you're doing in your life. If you're flipping burgers, cleaning floors, whatever, you're an executive, you always work your butt off. And that's what I did. You know, I never, you know, came late, left early or, you know, slacked at anything. I always gave myself 110%. It was just more the 
being the only woman in, in a certain department, it was more of that kind of stuff that I had to like the sex and the abuse and chauvinism and all that kind of stuff that I had to deal with at, at that age that I wasn't expecting because in the military, I had, it was nothing. Not one time did I ever hear a comment about me not being able to do my job because I was a woman. And in the police force, I just got bombarded with it. So how did you, I think that's a really important theme because uh, it obviously manifests in, you know, different roles between gender. How did you, I mean, you're, you're still so young and it's so important to remember that you're in your early 20s. You've been like, you've lived a full life and you're still in your early 20s. How did you manage being put into that situation? Because to my understanding, I mean, we were talking before I press record, I was like, you know, part of you is my shadow because I feel like you really confronted sort of that gender discrimination. I think a lot of us women can kind of, you know, take a step back and kind of, you know, become me, can kind of be like, okay, we like don't want to disrupt, you know, what's been in society for a long time. And I feel like you kind of like, I think almost literally like kind of pointed the gun at someone was like, you know, if you touch me, I'll like hit the clip, the, yes. the trigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something I know. It sounds like, lines. you know what? I, I, I was like, young. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, listen, back in, in my time, right, you know, there was no one I could go to and, and complain mm. about anything or whatever, you know, because they basically tell me to suck it up, whatever. You choose this kind of job, be the only woman, right? You know, and don't forget, you know, as the only woman too in this department, if I had a bad day, it wasn't because I had a bad day. It was because I was a woman, right? right? So I always had to be over, you know, one above everybody, right? But that was the one thing that I said, I want to take that, you know, I'm not like if somebody was inappropriate or said something inappropriate to me, I fired back right away. Because at that point in my career, I mean, a lot of things happened prior to if you read the book, right? I snapped. And I said, there is no way that anyone's ever going to take advantage of me. Even at like 20, I was in my early 20s. And I did point my gun when we were going up the stairs and that guy touched my whatever, my butt. And I pulled out <laughs> my gun and I said, you know what? You touch my butt and I'll pull the trigger the next time, whatever. And and I was serious. Yeah. And then I put it back in my holster and it never happened again. Mm. <laughs> I mean, right. so, you know, I almost had to become this crazy person in order to survive that kind of environment. Right. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just one incident. It was a number of incidences. Right. But eventually I got this reputation. Okay. Don't mess with her because she's crazy and I don't care. If that's what I had to be to her, you know, which is unfortunate, right? That you shouldn't have to work in an environment like that. Right. But I had no choice, right? And eventually it does start to settle, right? But if I let things slide and let things slide, then you know what happens at the end. They try to go to the next level and to the next level, right? And then, and I, like I said, there was no support system. They, you know, they said, you know, you want, you want this job, you deal with it. So I said, okay, I'll deal with it. I just, I love it. I love it. <laughs> So in, in relation to, and sorry if I don't pronounce this right, but Belouche. Um, yeah. So when, when you're in this sort of team, to my understanding, this is when, you know, things emotionally sort of begin to unravel. Like you, you sort of go through quite a lot within sort of this Belouche team. Can you sort of share more about your time in this? Yeah, I mean, well, the Belush is a spying agency, mostly internal, right? And it was mm -hmm. very intense because I did not have the street experience that police officers need, right? Like in the academy, I mean, any country in the world will tell you, you learn nothing in the academy, you learn it on the streets, right? They just give you a little taste of, of what you might expect, right? You know, so that's why it was so overwhelming because I didn't know the, the streets or the people in the streets or the criminals and whatnot, right? But we, it was very secretive too, like, you know, some of my training, for example, would consist of, you know, I, one of the agents would take me into like a city, like Haifa or something in a busy area. And we'd walk down the street and he'd point to different people and have to, you know, place their, their, their nationality. Is it Jewish? Is it Muslim? Is it Christian? Is it Swedish? Is it American? And listen to different accents, listen to different languages. And then, you know, me and you would have a conversation, but I have to follow what these two people are doing on either side. So it's, you know, your brain is working in, in so many different functions that it, I wasn't used to it. I felt like it was going to explode, right, you know? <laughs> Um, and they'd purposely, like even in the car, when, you know, we'd have to listen to communication, they'd purposely put the, the music really loud for a distraction, right? So that kind of training is what, you know, you have to learn it because you're not born mm -hmm. with it, right? So that was very difficult. So that was a hard, hard transition there. But I think, too, it was the abuse of power, you know? One of my biggest pet peeves is people in power abusing authority, right? You know, and I think too, at some point, you know, you start to abuse your authority as well. 
Right. Because I knew I had certain powers, like, you know, for example, a stupid example is like in if I was, re- you know, if I, I finished a, an operation or an assignment and I'm going home and there's traffic, I could, you know, I just drive on the shoulder because who's right. going to stop me? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We all it's kind of a brotherhood. I should put my badge and whatever or, or get in, you know, so you start to abuse it. And that, and that for me is kind of what changed later, like when I was closer to 30 saying, you know, who, who am I becoming? I'm becoming this crazy person, right? Almost a little bit too aggressive. And I remember mm-hmm. coming home for, for two weeks to see my parents and my mom just said a completely different person, right? Because wow. you're exposed to things that most normal people aren't, you know? Um, and it just makes your life easier when you can be a bully. Yeah, I completely understand. And I know around that sort of age of 30, you know, you, you even sort of speak about in your book, kind of coming to this understanding of or questioning even of like feeling slightly naive you know you were young and you were Mm -hmm. sort of had this like idea of being like you know a female James Bond and it was kind of like this romanticized life which I think you know most of us can understand when we're growing growing up with those movies and stuff right like that's that's what we get delivered that's what we think it's life but you know, you of all people know it, it's not necessarily like that. It's a lot more real. It's a lot more raw, a lot more confronting and a lot more traumatic. Um, Absolutely. Can you sort of share more about sort of, I guess, um, coming into that awareness of like, oh, wow, this actually maybe isn't what I always thought that it was going to be and feel like? Well, I mean, I think too, we were dealing with very rough um, people, right? You know, and I think mm-hmm. for me, I just thought, being a Belush agent, being who I was, um, you know, that you would get more respect from people that you were dealing with. No siree. You know what I mean? They talked to you and treated you very, very poorly. They were aggressive with you. So you couldn't be the soft, nice little, you know, good Canadian girl, which I was, right? You know, right. prior to, you know, I always did things by the book, tried to be polite, tried to, you know, you know, always make things right. You you could not function like that. So for me, it was a complete transition, right? You know, um, even with working with certain people and certain criminals, you know, and to, to rough handle them, it, it's hard. I hate to say this, but almost you had to, because if not, they would, they would take advantage of you. They would hurt you in stuff. So, you know, you completely change. You become like, you're completely robotic, no feelings, no nothing to anything, right? You know, and for me, that was a hard transition because if you know my personality prior to, it wasn't like that. You know, I wasn't. I had more of the compassion and, you know, and I think women too are, we are a little bit more sensitive to things, right? Mm-hmm. But that disappeared and <laughs> whatever. Yeah. yeah. And and then it carries through like, you know, into your personal life as well. Like, you know, I'm glad that I didn't have kids or, you know, a husband or whatnot, because I don't know how those guys did what we did and can go home and be normal. Because I took it out on the bike, right? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or a punching bag or whatever. And I didn't go to debriefing because it was so frustrating with some of the things that we had to go through and some of the things that we had to do and some of the things that we had to see that how do you be normal after that, right? You know, and I think it started to eat at me, you know, like I said, in my 30s when I said, I don't think I can do this anymore without exploding mentally. Yeah, because to my understanding, even a little bit of like fear and paranoia started coming into your life. Uh, you lost someone that you knew due to an assassination and that even your name was sort of on the hit list, so to speak. Yep. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? Because I think like for me in trying to understand your story, I was like, that's when it really got real and the kind of walls of this romantic for star, like really started kind of peeling away that like your life could be at danger and that death is a true possibility if you continue in this line of work. Right. I mean, there was two kidnapping attempts on me, you know, and I think um, a branch of intelligence had, office, you know, agents following me to, for my safety, which I knew mm-hmm. they did, but they didn't tell me. Right. You know, <laughs> but yeah, we talk about paranoia. Absolutely. I never I had my bread attached to me like it was my my third arm. <laughs> right. You know what I mean, I slept with it with knives and whatnot. Even when I ran, I never was not armed, even in my house and even coming into my house and, you know, looking around in my bathroom and my, you know, and seeing any little thing that whatever, because you have like a photogenic mind, but that's kind of ingrained in you when you are in Israel. Like when you go to your car, you don't go right to your car. You do a little walk around, you look underneath, right. It looks anything suspicious, right. Um, because things happen there, right. Especially mm-hmm. with what you, what you're doing. And, you know, and I think my identity too, even though they, they moved me a lot as I was the only woman in the Belouch, so I was a very easy target. 
So after that assassination, you know, I was kind of next in line and that's where the transition had to happen. Right. You know, um, uh, so yeah. And that's when I, when I started to get, a, to be afraid. And when you start to be mm-hmm. afraid, you you can't do that kind of work. It's, it's over. And what was like the, the moment that like you really like committed to making the decision, like I'm going to have to change my lifestyle moving forward. I mean, it was kind of a process because mm. honestly, the only thing that made me feel alive and the only thing I wanted to do as crazy as this may seem was to compete. I wanted yeah. to be a pro cyclist, you know, and I would see the many teams from Europe come to Israel to train because our weather is very good and our roads are great. Right. I know where we were working, most people can't go there. Right. But I'm talking about different parts of Israel. And I was and I wanted so badly to do that. Right. You know, and I thought this is insane. Like, you know, from all the from all the stuff that I've gone through and the fighting and the challenges and the permissions and, and the money that the state of Israel has invested in me. And now I want to just leave it all and be a bike rider, you know, which is, <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it was hard. Right. But I knew that this career was ending for me. You know what I mean? And I think it was the only thing, a thing that I wanted to do. Um, and you know, at 30 years old, you know, it's still, you're young, but you're not so young for that sport. Right. You know, so that's kind of what I was hanging on to, to keep my sanity, right? Because it was my best friend. It was my therapist when I was, when I would finish different assignments, right? It was riding mm-hmm. the bike as hard as I could right. um, and just let out, you know, all those frustrations. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Cause I find that really fascinating because I do long distance running and it's, I feel like that's kind of been my form of, form of therapy to an extent. Um, and, you know, people within that community, I think most of us kind of relate in that sense of like, that's what, has been a huge healer in our life. Do you think that cycling has kind of been that healer in your life for everything that you sort of went through up into that point in your life? Oh, I'm going to say 110%. You know, Mm -hmm. I think many people can, um, can relate to this. You know, when you have an issue or a problem or something's bugging you, I can just go out for a ride or even a run and I'll figure it out and I'll always feel better when I come back, right? You know what I mean? And I think for me, that was that was a big thing. I always, when I had an issue or a problem or whatnot, I didn't need to talk to anybody. I just needed to ride my bike. It would clear my mind and something would trigger in my head and I'd figure it out every single time, right? And I think that's why I just love the sport. And I think a lot of people who have stressful jobs or, you know what I mean, or they're in, in difficult positions or whatnot, that's why they find their salvation in long distance running or riding or whatnot, because you can really laser in focus and just do your thing. And I think that's what's required in ultra endurance racing. And so you choose that you want to do professional cycling. I'd love to know what does being a professional cyclist mean to you specifically? Well, I mean, for me, I wanted to do races like, you know, like the Tour de France or Tour de Lode, you mm-hmm. know, um, so that was my, my goal, you know, and mm-hmm. mind you too, I mean, I was a national champion in Israel in the sport of duathlon and, you know, and I excelled not in the run. I mean, I was a good runner. I wasn't a fast runner. I was, cause I can go long in the military. You just have to go long and carry a lot of load. Right. Um, but it was the bike that, where I excelled in, you know what I mean? So then I thought, you know what, I, I can do this. And I thought that I was better than I was. I mean, mind you, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fish in a small pond. Israel is tiny, right? right? You know what I mean? <laughs> So, I mean, you know, so, I mean, uh, that's where I got my, my ass kicked was when I came back to North America and I, okay, this is what cycling is all about. You're not that good. (laughs) I mean, so I had my work cut out for me. (laughs) So what's that period of your life like for you? Because like up until this point, I feel like, you know, as I've shared, I feel like anything you sort of like touched or like immersed yourself in, you became like an absolute champion, high achiever, breaking records, like anything you touched just turned to gold. This kind of felt like it was like kind of the first taste of going into something and it being more of a longer term commitment to kind of reach where you were sort of wanting to get to the outcome. Oh, totally. I mean, it took me eight years when I came yeah. into the sport. I mean, I excelled in the first year because I could rely on my fitness, but you know, cycling is like a chess game. You have to think three moves before you make your own move. Right. And I didn't get the warm and fuzzies from the Federation. The Canadian Federation basically said I was too old. You know, I had basically missed the boat. Um, you know, I wasn't talented enough. I was too big to be a climber, too small to be a sprinter. Right. You know? Yeah. And so that's kind of what I was left with. Right. When I came into the sport, you know, I was on a d- development national team. But you know what? I would go into these races, like when I hit kind of the pro levels of racing and I would come in so last 
that I wouldn't even know where the finish was. They, everybody would go, I'd see my car in an empty parking lot. And I go, okay, damn, that must be it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was humiliating. It was so mm-hmm. embarrassing. Um, and people were saying to me, you know what, like, what the heck are you doing? I'm not like 38 years old. Right. You know? So it was, it was a process. I mean, I basically excelled, you know, after being humiliated in public, I was, you know, I mean, I'm making myself sound worse than what I was. I was racing for a pro team. <laughs> And one of the directors, a big U.S. team that I really wanted to race for, they were talking about a cyclist, a rider, and I was more of a domestique. And he said something to the effect of when the road goes up, she drops down. And then he goes, then he says to his team, Goldstein, that's my last name, can't climb worth shit. And everyone starts laughing. And that moment was the transition moment for me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to show them exactly what I can do, right? And after that year, I came back the following year, not only winning hilly races, but setting new records. And that was at 39 years old. And what do you think you did differently sort of in that transition year compared to sort of how you were competing before that? I wasn't training hard enough. Mm. Um, You know, I... I needed to, to, to be, you know, climbing is very important, right? You know, so I, I basically moved to a more hilly location, you know, uh, in Vernon, it's got more of the mountains. I dropped about 12 pounds, hired a climbing coach, ate, breathed, slept climbing and, you know, came back untouchable, right? You know, and just had in one year, all of a sudden I had contracts just thrown at me, you know what I mean? And I think it was more upstairs of me saying enough of this bullshit, right? You know what I mean? You are better mm-hmm. than that. Um, and I think I started to make excuses, you know, of why I wasn't excelling. Right. You know, right. and sometimes you have to pull up your, your big girl pants and you have to work hard, really hard. If this is what I wanted to do. And so it was basically everything else on a shelf and I'm lasering in. It's now or never. I can't keep doing this till I'm 50. Right. You know, it sort of took you like eight years and like what what's driving you throughout this time? Because eight years is, you know, is a long time like you know and obviously there's been pivotal moments like when someone says you know you can't climb you know a mountain quick enough and so you're adapting in in that way but like what are the other things that are keeping you going and staying so committed throughout that time I was so determined to be this great (laughs) DC rider right that I had never I mean I had never quit anything in my life you know Mm. and I just knew that I would regret it if I did and I had to find a way. I mean, I was getting picked up by you because I was a pretty aggressive rider, but there was just something missing. And my directors were so frustrated mm. with me, right? You know, and they knew that I was better than what I was. And I don't know why it took me so long, right? You mm. know, but sometimes you do you have to get slapped a little bit before you realize, you know what? And 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 what I like about that is, you know, in the sport of pro racing is where I prove that you don't need a gift in anything you choose to do in order to excel. Right. I don't care if it's music, arts, entertainment, whatever, because there's a gift we all have. And it's called the gift of work. And that's what I use that gift. We all of us have it in order to be this great cyclist, because I was not talented in cycling by any means. I was not, you know, and even at that age. Right. You know, I mean, I had the best years on the bike at 39, 40, 41 and 42 where, you know, and so it's because of of the determination, like I said, of, of working your butt off. And it wasn't without its challenges. Um, You know, you had two, at least two pretty big accidents. Can you share more? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, big time. I should be dead by now. I mean, I think I have have one more line, like nine lines. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I'm, I can trust that you'd be using it wisely. <laughs> can you share more with, the, you know, the listeners that maybe haven't heard about this part of your story? Because to me, yeah. like this was like, yeah, it was an oh yeah moment even for me sort of reading your story. Well, like I said, at 39, I had that breakthrough moment, right? You know, mm-hmm. where I had all all these opportunities. Do I stay in North America? Do I sign with, you know, in some team in Europe? So I did one more race to see if I could really climb against a more international field, right? So I went to uh, a race called um, Cascade Classic. And there was uh, a German rider, two American riders. They were very good climbers. I remember they ascended up um, the first stage of this five-stage race. And I was the only racer in that whole peloton of 180 that could keep that that pace. So we, you know, we crested the mountain. I kind of, I was like, yes, I kind of categorize myself as a climber. But when you go up, you also must go down. So we start descending. And as you know, on racing bikes, we can reach speeds of up to 100 kilometers an hour. So we're in that kind of tuck position. And some other riders are starting to catch up with us. Then 
on my left hand side, I saw this wheel kind of squeezing into a, you know, a spot that really wasn't there because she didn't want to touch the center line because you get a penalty. So instead of touching the center line and getting her five second penalty, she leaned into me. And at 80 kilometers an hour, I end up landing on my face, Ooh, instant facelift, right? I mean, I think um, I broke almost every bone in my body. My clavicle was broken, arm dislocated back there. All my ribs were busted, my hips, my legs, my fingers, my toes. I mean, from the friction of the fall, the first layer of skin, you know, um, my lips were hanging. It was, I honestly thought that I was going to die. That was, and in Velo News at the time, it was actually categorized as one of the worst crashes in the history of the sport, minus the people who have died, right? You know, um, so that, and, you know, and then I ended up uh, in the trauma unit in, in Bend, Oregon, and the diagnosis wasn't good. You know, they said it was questionable about my ability to walk properly without a walker or a cane, but it was unquestionable that I'd never race again. And that was the mother of all crashes. And so that was a really low part. <laughs> Right, 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 you know, yeah. so it was tough, right? You know, it's get, getting out of, of this, you know, because you work so hard for something, and then mm. you know, for eight years and 30 seconds, it's all gone, and you don't know if you'll ever get it back or if your life will be the same again. So, that was a, a really tough, you know, moment of my life. Um, but I I said, I don't care how long it takes, you know, the pain I'm going to go through, I'm going to get back on that bike, I'm going to race again, and I'm going to come back even stronger than I did before all this happened. And it was a process and it was definitely, I'm going to tell you, it was what was going upstairs because if I honestly mm -hmm. believed everything that I was being told, I wouldn't right. be sitting here talking to you right now. And I think the mind is a powerful thing. I mean, I'm not a hokey pokey person or whatever, <laughs> but I mean, being in that positive mode, I can feel my body starting to bind, right? You know, mm -hmm. and I, and the only thing I could do when I was sitting in that, lying in that hospital bed, I should say, was just ab contractions. But every day I did something today that I couldn't do the day before. And I worked my butt off, right? And that's the only thing I could do was just contract my abs. And, you know, um, I think I was released from the hospital about four months earlier than they had predicted because I was healing so fast. I was in a wheelchair and I was back on my bike and race ready that following season. Share with us more about your mindset on you know, overcoming these labels, you know, you see labels as limitations. And I think that's such a beautiful theme throughout your life, you know, even from when you're young, and you're sort of told, you know, you have one leg longer than the other, and these sorts of like disadvantages, quote, unquote, and you're told by these experts, quote, unquote, exactly. that like, these are your limitations in life. And that's, you know, you're just going to have to deal with it. Share, share with me more about like, just being so strong in that headspace that like, you know, no matter who tells you, particularly if it's experts, like, you know, you got to believe in yourself and what you're capable of and get out right. there and give it a go. Well, I mean, I wish people, uh, professionals, doctors, psychiatrists would, wouldn't say those kind because who are you to say right. who, you're not God to predict what can happen you know mm -hmm. um and I think it, once a person believes it you know that's it game over mm -hmm. it's not going to happen you won't even heal properly right and I think you have to give them the perspective of you know what let's work our butt off let's see what we can do and do everything we can to get you back to where you were opposed to you know what your life is over it's gonna you know you, you won't be able to do this a b c or d right why don't we do that instead and then you know what I mean and then it gives them hope Hope, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And I think it would have changed a lot of people's lives. I didn't have that. I had that in me, right? Saying, you know what, I'm going to prove them wrong. And there was doubt, you know what I mean? I mean, at some points too, I, I had doubt and I struggled, you know, I had more bad days than good days, but I was determined and I saw the progression and I said, I'm going to do this. I don't care what, how long it's going to take and what I'm going to go through. I'm going to get there. And like I said, it, I think it's all upstairs, what's going on in your head. And for most people, you know, just believe in yourself. I mean, sometimes the only support you're going to have is you, you know, you're not going right. to get it from outside sources. So you got to believe in that. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the only crash that I've had. Right. I mean, I've had many, you know, and I can't tell you how many times people have said it, you know, it'll never happen for you. Never. I mean, if I got a, a penny for every time somebody had said that to me, I'd be a millionaire. Right. You know <laughs> That's why yeah. I love it when people say that. Come on, bring it on. Let me show you, right? You know, but not in a in a negative way, in a positive way, right? You know, um, so I think that's the main thing is just believing in yourself and that you know, no matter where you are, like you know, I was at the bottom of the barrel, like that. There's no lower place than that, right? And then to crawl out of that and to come back and be even stronger than that, you know, I mean, like I said, I had the best years after that crash, right? right? At 40, 41, and 42, that's when I really excelled, when I actually retired and made that transition, you know. And even after that crash, 
two years or three years later, I got hit by a car again, flying through the air and two compounds, <laughs> both my arms snapped. And that's why that was when I retired into ultra endurance racing. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was training with no arms, you know, so <laughs> just read my book and <laughs> you can go through anything. Trust me. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I remember reading that, like you set up like two ironing boards or something and put your Correct. like, yeah. Broken arms on yeah, them I mean, and, and kept was, training. It was, yeah, it was my it was my <laughs> last race. It was a crit in, in Redlands, um, California, and I was coming back to the team car. And this lady in a black Hyundai, she was texting, and she mm-hmm. ended up hitting me at about eighty kilometers an hour, which ejected me about twenty five feet in the air, and then not to fall on my. And I remember as I'm going through the air, saying, "Oh shit, here I go again!" Right, and so I bring my arms out not to have the impact in my, on my face. Right, mm-hmm. you know. Or my head, L- like led the first of- time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? You know, I mean, already, oh, everything is starting to heal. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that that was basically my retirement from pro cycling into ultra endurance mm-hmm. racing. Um, and I actually had planned to qualify for race across America that year. Um, and you have to do a, a you know, one of their um, qualifying races. And I had like three months. And I said, I'm still going to do it. I'm just going to train with two ironing boards. And I had, so I, I said, when I was released from the hospital, my mom had to come. She had to be my, my support system because I have no arms. And um, yeah, I had two ironing boards. My bike was set up on a trainer and that's how I would train just, you know, and it was horrendous. <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> you, know? you did do it. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, yeah. Speaking of getting there, I mean, you did, you, you went into race across America um, right. which is like, I think the largest cycling race in the world, right? It's like the hardest race in the world. Correct. Yeah. Um, share with me more about this. Cause this just seems like the ultimate of ultimate events to do in your life. Right. Well, I mean, I, like I struggled in pro racing, you know what I mean? But I knew in ultra endurance racing that I would excel pretty fast because of there's three elements that I had. One, was my ability to push myself, you know, beyond my limits to my ability to completely ignore pain. And the third one, most important is I can function on very little sleep. You know, I can mm-hmm. ride for 48 hours, almost 50 hours and still kind of, I mean, you're very loopy, right? But I mean, I think those are, <laughs> those are very important for, for, you know, for ultra yeah. endurance racing, right? Because the clock doesn't stop ticking. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you know, everything you can do on the bike, you do it on the bike. So that was my biggest goal was to race, race across America. Right. And You know, and so I did these smaller races and even that first race, race across Oregon, which was my qualifying race, I ended up setting a woman's record, you know, even training in that condition. I thought, damn, if I can do that, then I said, I'm going to go into race across America and try and win it. I didn't say it to anybody, right? Because I don't want to be too cocky, right? (laughs) But, you know, but I mean, Ram is a completely different animal, you know what I mean? So, but I just felt like that's, you know, as I, uh, as I got, you know, better, you know, in, in that first year with those qualifying races. That was my goal was to be a rookie and, you know, and to win race across America. And mind you, I wasn't the favorite to win because there was, you know, an American racer that was there for her third time. And then the Canadian rider who trained in Argentina, this was her third or second time. She was the favorite to win. And then there was little old me coming in my first time saying, you know what, I'm good. I got this right. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. you got nothing. So, so Ram is a, is a 3000, like just under 5,000 kilometer nonstop race. And you have 12 days to do it. So in a 48 hour period, you're sleeping between zero to three hours. So how we do it is I ride the first uh, day, first night and into the second night. So I'll probably go down about 42 hours. And then every 24 hours you go, you go down for about 90 minutes to two and a half hours. Right. So that was the cycle. And then the last three days, you, you cut that right to 90 minutes, depending on how fast you're going. Right. You know, but don't forget with race cross America, I mean, you're going to face, you know, it's not a matter of if, but when back, neck, knee, constipation, diarrhea, swelling, you know, and mother nature will throw everything at you. So, you know, it's just the the most unexpected, most difficult race you can ever imagine both physically and mentally. And because of that, like, cause you know, I'm super passionate about mindset, like what is going through your mind and how is it different to anything else you have experienced? Because this is like, you know, a new experience for you. Well, it's hard to explain, like, you know, coming into my first race across America, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had Mm. to sit on my butt and ride, you know, as much as I could. And I trained all hours of the day and whatnot, you know. Um, And I don't know if you know this, but in my first RAM, uh, I was on record breaking pace for the first three days, you know, and I go, well, damn, you know what I mean? I go, this is hard, but I got this. 
And then on about midway through the third day, I felt this sharp pain shoot from the middle of my head down my buttocks. And I was developing an ultra rider's worst nightmare. It's called Shermer's neck. So basically what happens is all muscles that hold your head up, they collapse. So, and it happens really fast. So within an hour and a half of this pain, my chin is now on my chest and I can't move my head. I can't lift my head. So in order to ride, I'm now supporting my head with one hand and handling, you know, the bike with another hand, changing, shifting gears and whatnot. And, you know, your head weighs eight pounds, right? Mine might be a little <laughs> bit less of like some brain cells, but, you know, and so, so my crew says, you know, how are we going to finish this damn race? I go, I don't care if I have to crawl across the country. We're going to finish this race. This is my first go, right? You know? So the record, that, that record pace, you know, had gone down the toilet. So they started to come up with apparatuses, right? You know, how to get me across the country. So the solution was, after trying multiple things, was they basically shaved me from year to year. And with the hair that was on the top of my head, they took tensor bandage. They French braided it into my hair. They pulled my head back and they tied it to the back of my heart rate monitor. So it's kind of like a bobble head. And that's how I finished my first race across America. And I can't tell you the pain that I had gone through, right? I mean, it was so bad. I, I was like vomiting off the side of the bike, right? You know, um, yeah. And, but when there's a will, there's a way. Sometimes you have to find it. You know, and like I said, I never quit anything in my life. And I knew if I quit that race, I would regret it, right? And like I said, I said, we'll, we'll do our best, you know, and sometimes you just suck it up, you do your best. And you know what? I ended up winning the race anyways. So, you know, sometimes you're going to go through pain, right? You know, and I can tell you that was painful. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It, like literally what's just going through my head is like, it's like so effing hardcore. Like it's just like, like it's just, it's next level. Like, you know, we talk about this as sort of like mental fortitude and resilience and toughness. But, you know, when I first heard, you know, how you sort of achieved getting to particularly like sort of not only finish this race, but win it. It was just like, it's mind boggling to me. Like, obviously I have very limiting beliefs around this space and I'm like, there's no freaking way I want to do that. Like it's very special. And I think that's what's so amazing about you is like, you genuinely, like genuinely like believe that like you will not quit and that you will do whatever, like literally whatever it takes to get the job done. Yeah. I mean that, that started right from, I mean, even in the military, the hard times, right? You know, mm-hmm. I think is, is, is like patterns are often repeated. And I think when we throw in the white towel, you know, mm-hmm. with things that are difficult or things that go south, it's easy to keep doing that, right? I don't know what quitting is. And I don't want to know what quitting is because I've never quit anything in my life. Even if it's not the outcome that you want, even if I didn't win and I came in dead last, I would still say, you know what? I still did it. I still did what I could and I did not give up, right? You know what I mean? So, I mean, a big message is that whatever you do choose to do, you make it to your finish line, no matter what the outcome is, right? You know what I mean? And then you'll learn from the second time you do it, right? Because I am i kid you not, you know, you, you know, we all know that people who quit one thing, man, it's not going to, it's probably going to happen many, many times, right? Many, many times, you know, and if they're doing this a lot of times, stop doing this, right? You know, and I think to me, that's, that's the biggest thing is you find the way there is a, uh, a passion, a, pi- a you know, a fire inside of you, you find it, you know? Mm-hmm. And for me, like I said, it was the regret. I never want to have regrets. I never, ever want to be sitting on my deathbed saying, you know what I wish or what if, you know, or damn, I should have done it then. You know, I, I rather suffer then and saying, you know what, that'll just make me stronger for my next challenge. And it will with anything else you choose to do, it won't seem as hard and you won't quit because you don't know what quitting is. Mm -hmm. So powerful because, yeah, I I definitely believe that it's like, you know, the first moment you quit, it's just like you start bargaining with yourself every time that you know that's an option. And yeah, without fail, most times that you choose to kind of tap out, particularly in endurance when the times are tough. I mean, that's why we're out there, right? But in that moment, it just like you start rationalizing all these reasons as to why you should stop. Um, but you know, then you sort of have a rest and you get some food into you and then you wonder, you're like, I could have done better. So yeah, I really love that sort of like no options space to be because as, as you're obviously showing, it's like, there's other options out there. You got to adapt. And even if it doesn't mean that you win, it's like just the, the idea that you can get it done is, is very powerful. And obviously, as you know, it filters into other areas of your life as well. Exactly. I mean, quitting should never, ever be an option unless of course it's life threatening or whatever. Right. Okay, that's a different story. Mm-hmm. However, I mean, you shouldn't even say that word. It shouldn't even be in your vocabulary, you know, of, of quitting. Like I said, 
whatever you choose to do, you finish it. If you, if that's really what you choose to do or, or don't do it. Right. And I think too, is preparing as well. You know, when I go into an event, for example, right. You know, I give myself 110 different scenarios of what could happen and what will I do. Right. You know what I mean? In order to achieve it, because you have to think of things that are going to go south, not the great things, because it's missing ultra endurance racing. You know, like you said, you are going to go through a roller coaster ride. You're going to hate. You're going to hate it. You're going to think about something that happened, you know, 10 years ago. You're going to get mad (laughs) and you're going to get happy. You're going to be totally bipolar. You will be so. (laughs) You're going to go through a a, a series of emotions. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. But but that's the challenge. You know, we are human and it's and it's amazing what we can do. Right. I mean, with pro racing, it really teaches what the human body is capable of of doing. Right. And I think I proved that, especially through my athletic career. And like I said, with anything I do choose to do, I just reflect on the crap that I've gone in the past. Right. It can't (laughs) be as bad as that. (laughs) So besides sort of obviously having this very strong mindset of not quitting, like what is another sort of mindset that you think that you've implemented in your life that is like, um, you know, just as powerful, almost just as powerful in terms of, you know, how you've come to achieve so much in your life? I mean, I think is, um, look, it, this is a one-time deal on on earth, right? You know, I think you have to mm-hmm. do the things that you love, right? Mm-hmm. I learned a big lesson from my grandmother, right? You know, she finally started doing the things that she loved to do at 65 years old. Um, And unfortunately, she ended up having cancer and she so badly did not want to die. And her last words to me, and I knew I'd never see her again. I remember I was on release from the military. And she said to me, like I said, you never want to be sitting on your deathbed saying the words I wish or what if, right? You know, and I think it's a one time deal. And we have to remember that, you know, you can't stop living when you're still alive. And I don't care if you're 20. I don't care if you're 90. You have to do the things that you love. Because your biggest regret will be the things that you haven't done, not the things that you have done, right? And do as much Mm -hmm. as you can and cherish it and don't be afraid of it because this is it. This is what we've got. This is a one-time deal, man. We don't get second chances. I love it. So you obviously finished this race. You won. But um, rumors are you want to go back for more and actually break the world in the race. After the after 2011, I basically, I mean, I had lived out of a duffel bag for, you know what I mean, for yeah. almost like 13 years. And I just said, and that's when I kind of took a break. I thought I was going to retire. Mm-hmm. And then I started doing speaking and, you know, wrote the book and whatnot, right? You know, and then, but I always had it kind of in the back of my head that I can do better. I know I can do better. And so right. when I turned 50, maybe I was going through a midlife crisis. Who knows? <laughs> That's a pretty cool midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going back into racing, right? You know? Yeah. Um, and so then, yeah. And people thought, okay, you're crazy. You're old. You're 50, whatever, you know? And then so I did um, a qualifying race, you know, the, the uh, Silver State. And, you know, I think six months after I announced my whatever, my – my intro back into sport, to racing. And then I ended up setting a new woman's record. And I said, you know what? I can still ride the damn bike, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. so I kind of went from there, you know? And so I, yeah, I'm getting better and learning and, you know, and, and even this year, like being the first woman to win race across America, but I know I can do better. I can go faster. Right. So it's <laughs> yeah. not over yet. <laughs> yeah. It, that, that part of your story definitely, you know, reminded me almost like taking me back to your coach, you know, Alan, who, who was your kickboxing coach. And I think, you know, when you won the world championship, he said something almost like, you know, you could have done better, which was yeah. funny because I, I thought of him you know, when you, you come across the line is I think you were like the first female winner in like 32 years of this race. And you're like, oh, I could have done better. I could have broken that red record. And oh, I was like, oh, it's totally. still with her. <laughs> Decades know, later, it's still yeah. with her. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, I mean, I remember crossing the line. I'm smiling because I'm just going, oh, shit, I have to do it again. 11 yeah. days. <laughs> like, yeah. like, that was a smile of goddamn, you know. And so, I mean, because, the, I mean, the challenge was, of course, this year, I don't know. I mean, it was the heat, like going to 50 Celsius yeah. for multiple days and then not even, you know, barely going down through most through the United States. It was torture. I mean, I can't even, I mean, I'm from the Middle East. I can handle heat, but that heat was un undeniably the most difficult thing I had to ever experience. Right? I mean, I burned myself right through my Jersey. That was the intensity of the heat. Right. And you can't ride that hard when you're going through, you know, yeah. those kind of temperatures. Cause you have to keep your body. I mean, it's dangerous. You can die. Right. So mm-hmm. it was a much slower pace race because of that, not to make excuses or anything, but 
You know, I, th- I think if the we I trained for a 10 day finish, that was my, you know, what I mean, that's why it was super disappointing crossing that line, mm-hmm. trying to pretend I'm super, happy, super right? disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just throwing in, you know, my, my tweet, she's going, oh, shit, 11 days, you gotta do it again, you know. <laughs> But, you know, like I said, with Ram, anything can happen. You can't predict it. Like, yeah. who's to say that next year won't be the same for the racers, mm-hmm. right? You know, but mm-hmm. I got to give it one more shot, you know, Beautiful. and and I, I still feel like even I'm not, you know, I'm a little older. I'm 52 now, so that I can, I still, I still think I can do it in 10 days. So I got to, I got to try it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to following your journey a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Leah, thank you so much for this awesome conversation. Honestly, you, um, Yes, just reading your story has just been absolutely fabulous. I just appreciate it so much, particularly as a woman in, you know, ultra distance sport. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly someone personally, it kind of goes into this space a lot more exploratory and it's very light and non-competitive, but, right. you know, I love to taste of your mindset. I'm certainly going to bring it into my own life. So thank you so much, Leah. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> it was fun. It, it was fun. I really yeah, enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. So Leo, I'd love to ask you on a final note, what does it mean to you to be human? I think it's to to do as much as you can to succeed, but to take in as many people as you can on the journey with you. And I think that's what's missing is the selfishness, you know, is just, you know, how good it feels when you can help others with the things that you've done and include them. And I think to me, that's what it means to be human. 